на трибунах холеют знамена, Облака под небесни плывут. На зеленом ковре стадиона разноцветные майки цветут. Hello and welcome back to the Russian Football News Podcast. After a solid start with two wins away from home, Russia have now totally collapsed in the Nations League group. To discuss this collapse, Stanislav Cherchesov's future, and dip back into the RFN mailbag, I'm your regular host, James Nichols. And back again this week is our usual two guests. Firstly, Richard Pike. Good evening, everybody. How are we all? I'm not too bad, mate, because we've got David Sanson back again. Yeah, good to be back. Um, sorry I couldn't make it last few weeks. Nah, it's fine. We've got the able substitutions in Artem and Hanu and everybody else. And we've got a new guest that's going to be featuring next week, so if everybody keeps an eye out for that one. I'll not spoil it yet, because it's quite an exciting one, but... First of all, we've got to start off with Sponaya. Now, they played two games since we last had recorded, in which they, just after their 0 0 draw with Moldova. On Sunday, they were defeated 3 2 by Turkey away. And then on Tuesday, they travelled to Serbia and were thrashed 5 0, in which they were actually 4 0 down at half time. Now, both of these sides that Chachesov had named on the day were not quite as young and exciting as the one we had seen against Moldova, but did perform probably just as badly if not a lot worse to be frank in the Serbia game there was Guilherme in goal Karavayev at right back Igor Deveev and Georgi Jikia captain again in the middle Yuri Zhirkov at left back Magomed Ostroyev and Dala Kazayev in central midfield and then an attacking three of Alexander Yurokin Alexei Miranchuk and Anton Miranchuk behind lone star striker Anton Zavolotny Four of these play- these starters were actually withdrawn at half time in what was a surprising but perhaps warranted move from Churchesov. As Soslan Zhenayev, Roman Yevgenev, Ivan Obliakov, and Andrei Mostovoy replaced Guleyme, Deveev, Maranch, and the Maranchuk twins, each respectively. So, Russia now sits second in the group after bottling what was qualification to League A and pretty much. Oh, two games in was pretty pretty much guaranteed to get it if they continued their good form, defeating Hungary and Serbia away at the very start of the campaign. So the question at the top is, has to be, and what's been on the mind of a lot of people in Russian football, is this time for Stanislav Cherchesov to be sacked? It was quite a just disastrous selection. Zabolotny is nowhere near good enough this level. Zhirkov played the full 90 minutes. Guilherme once again, absolute error prone in goal. He made those four decisions at half time, but arguably the two important ones that he needed to make was Zhirkov and Zabalotny being brought off. And like I say, they played, they continued to play on. So, David, straight up, do you think Stani should be sacked? I mean, you know, we've got to give some credit to him because, you know, we, we've seen him get big results with, this, with these players and with worse players. And obviously with better players, um, we, but you know we've all been frustrated with with some of Stanny's squad selections and team selections over the past couple of years. You know, granted, we, you know he's he's missing some of his well the star player obviously in uh, Golovin. You know it would be, it would be amazing to have him in there. Obviously, G was out um, for this particular break, but it does feel like we need something fresh, someone who isn't going to pick Yuri Zhirkov. Uh, and Guillerme and Anton Zabalotny. It, it's 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 crazy to me also because obviously Stani was a goalkeeper and he still persists with Guillerme. Obviously Shunin Shunin didn't make the score this time because of COVID. Safonov didn't make the Serbia game because of COVID, and I think was rumoured to be starting if he hadn't done. He had an inconclusive test. Um, but we've seen time and time again. I think Guillerme even missed the last squad selection like last month or whenever that was. Um, and, you know, we did, we all have lambasted, you know, the Moldova game, it was a poor result, nil-nil, but it was a very experimental squad. All the young guys started pretty much. All the young guys who got called up into the squad started and played. It's, it's going to take these guys time to gel with the guys who were already in the squad um, and get used to a new style of play because obviously Chalov was playing up front instead of one of the big men who... Russia used to playing with, and also they were missing out on the, the creative trio of Golovin and the Um 
So I'm looking ahead and thinking, you know, we, we've seen the promise of, of the next generation with the under-21 squad. We know they're performing well for them and at club level, most of them. But Stanley still goes for his old guard. Like, I'm surprised he's still not been calling up Gavulov for the squad, like, to sit there on the bench. Um, <laughs> it, it does feel like we need a change. Um, and, you know, I wonder if the time to do it is not now. Uh, maybe let him have the Euros. Let that, that generation of the under-21s finish their, their cycle, play their under-20 on Euros. And at that point, cut it off. Right, change the manager. Let the under-21s graduate. And then usher in a new generation of managers and players at both levels. Yeah, I, I, it just seems all a little bit stagnant right now. And Churchesov has done... A fine job in the most part. They absolutely overachieved at the World Cup, and the, he's definitely galvanised them quite well and got quite a good mentality. But if you look at other sides, other successful sides, and the a lot of international coaching isn't about obviously bringing in big name transfers to change the squad because you can't do that. You have to work with the tools that you've got, and a lot of managers say. Euro 2016, for example, Wales got all the way to the semi-final. Nobody expected that. Chris Coleman is not a tactical genius at all in any form, but he galvanised that team and he was really strong on the psychological side of the game. It was all about bringing the nation together and it worked in the short term absolutely perfectly and it just got them going. Obviously, he had one of the best players in the world and one of the better players in the Premier League at the time in, Aaron Ram in Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey. He had a core to build that team around. Now, Stani did that at the World Cup. He got them up for it. But look, this is Russia. There's a very Russian patriotic man mentality of which when when the, when your back is up against the wall, you rise to it. You rise to that. Russia were the lowest ranked team in the entirety of the World Cup, but it was their World Cup. It was their moment. They were never going to underperform in any form. But if you look on the pitch, it's just there's there's no cohesive plan, which is the massive issue. The two games against Serbia and Hungary were generally, in my opinion, based more around Zuba's ability as a target man because he is an absolute beast at the top still. And then individual efforts and very little else. Even going back to the World Cup, it was that. You had Golovan scoring screamers. Zuba, again, surprising defenders with his sheer insane ability back to goal. Golovan scoring screamers, Cheryshev playing out of his skin. So, Richard, coming on to you, do you think Stani should be sacked? I probably thought about this, like, you know, um, several times during the day, actually, after last night's horror show. Um, I kind of actually, after having heard what David said, I kind of, I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, maybe to just give him these Euros this summer and then cut it off. Um, after the Euros and then bringing somebody else to usher in the new um, on the 21s generation after the Euros um, maybe you could look at look at the under 21s manager Mikhail Galatianov uh, to come in to replace Stani there isn't really a lot of um, Russian coaches to replace Stani with though um, you know and isn't it interesting how we've been talking the last couple of weeks on the podcast about the poor performances of Russian clubs in Europe and you could probably argue that you know the last two international breaks this one and the one before in October when they drew at home against um, was it Hungary and Turkey in uh, two draws which equally has cost them a chance of the Nations League um, promotion that you know the bad results domestic the bad results in Europe for the Russian clubs probably now feeding down to the national team as well but um, but yeah there isn't really a lot of um, Russian coaches available to replace Danny with I mean Galatyonov and then beyond that who else are you looking at I mean Slutsky's had the national team job before but you know he's you know I think he's pretty happy at Ruben Kazan he's got a good project there and uh, the team are progressing nicely and developing nicely under his um, under his management so I just don't think Sutsky would come back to the national team so apart from Galatyonov there isn't really a lot of other Russian candidates you could consider at the moment who are out of work so um, it's a difficult one um, but it, yeah like, I, I echo what you say James it has all got all a bit stagnant at the moment with uh, with Spornaya and um, Cherchasov's decision making is just regarding picking players for squad is just very very odd like like you know 
Yuri Zhirkov, I'm sorry, he should be nowhere near a national team squad right now. Um, you know, last season, I could sort of understand it when he came out of international retirement just after the World Cup. You know, a couple of months later, he reversed that decision. And he was still playing OK for the national team back then. You know, it was he was he was still doing an OK job for Zenit, OK job for the national team. And the, probably the plan was, was to play, you know, until Euro 2020. This summer, the Euros would happen. Then he would retire from football, probably full stop. But, you know, obviously it got put back due to the COVID pandemic. But just because the Euros have been put back to the because of the COVID pandemic shouldn't, you know, give you a uh, reason to carry on calling up a player just because, you know, they've been a good player in the past for Spornaya or just because they were part of the squad before. You know, you have to evolve and move on a team. And um, it's evidently clear to everybody, apart from Churchesoff, it seems that um, Shirkov has just passed it. It actually reminds me of when, um, you know, I remember when, um, wasn't it, Fabio Cannavaro got injured at Euro 2008 for Italy. And then after that, he was never the same player after that for club or country. And yet Lippi, Marcello Lippi kept calling him up even when it was obvious he was past it. And this is the, um, you know, no surprise Italy went out in the World Cup in South Africa in the first round. So this is, and this is a similar kind of situation to, in player-wise, to what you've got now with Zhirkov. It's a player who's evidently past his best. He's not good enough for both club or country at the minute, yet keeps getting picked. Um, and yeah, and the, the Zabalotny selection, that just highlights just how, Lacking Russia is in strikers at the moment. Chalov's out of form when Zuba doesn't get in the squad. Obviously, you know, there's other mitigating reasons why, you know, Churchsoft left um, left Zuba out. But, but yeah, it, I agree with you. It, it's really gotten stale at the moment on the Stanny. And um, it's the lack of evolution in the team that's frustrating. So, yeah, I really think this summer should represent, like what David said, this summer should represent a clean break. Move on from Stanley in the summer, maybe bringing Galatio on off as on twenty from on twenty ones to the senior squad and let's get this new young generation of good young players like Deveev, like Oblyakov, more of them into the squad, uh Yevgeniev, and let's um move forward from there. Yeah, absolutely. The his insistence on picking players who are not only out of form in the short term, but quite frankly don't have enough quality at all in the long term is just it's just mind-boggling. Most people, generally in in the in the nation, generally ex- accept that Zuba will retire within five years or so. Look at his age. Now, the man who is is his most obvious long-term successor for the national team right now is Alexander Sobolev. Ch- Stanislav Churchesov made the big deal of that that reunification of the two where they put aside their differences from that ridiculous spat last season ridiculous because the way it was blown up afterwards um and they put on social media of the two shaking hands and hugging each other and then Zuba's out dropped by talk dropped by churches of because he wants him out of the limelight okay fair enough i can see that decision well then surely the man who's ready made to replace him must come into the team yeah, he, he calls up Zabalotny, who's scored, what, twice against Tambov or some of the crap this season. He's absolutely <laughs> awful. And Sobolev only played 27 minutes out of the entirety of the game, of, of these games. Of, 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 and that was against Moldova and Turkey. He didn't play at all against against Serbia. Zabalotny probably could have scored three or th- two or three goals in the first half, but because of his absolutely abject finishing, which he's had since he was at Tosna. He couldn't score. Now, in Zuba's absence, Sobolev had to be the main striker. I mean, I know he's not been playing every game for Spartak as of late because of the form of Larson and Ponce, but that's not anything against Sobolev. He's been scoring goals. He scored twice against Ural in the last game that he did start for the side just before the international break. Now, in the game against Moldova, I can understand why he preferred Chalov. You, Chalov was called up late. He was obviously the third choice of Sobolev. He'd never been called up in a very long time. And then I mean, his game the debut before, and, and you, you play him in the less important game. And then obviously you've got to go with Sobolev, and you just keep Zabalotny there as like the the big lump up top, who's the backup if it goes to hell. You don't start him. I'm just continually mystified by these ridiculous decisions that he makes. But David, I will approach to you and become a little bit of a devil's advocate here is that is the current Russia side good enough? Because yes, there is a few issues with substitution, uh, with injury and other selection issues. But by and large, it does have what's pretty close to a first team squad. So do you think it's more down to the players rather than Churchesov, David? 
Um, not overly. I mean, as you said, Zabalotny. I mean, the game, the Serbia game, right? Um, the, the stat that went round afterwards was like Russia had an XG of like 3.5 or something compared to Serbia's one point something or other. Uh, and I'm sure the bulk of that came from Zabalotny because inside the first minute he had literally the whole penalty area to himself and he hit his shot straight straight at the goalkeeper. Um, if that was Zuba in there, you know, Zabalotny's hit it first time of the volley. Zuba ultimately would definitely have taken that ball down and slotted it in the corner. Uh, and that puts Russia 1-0 up within, within minutes and I was live tweeting the game Russia were having chances throughout the game. And at 1-0, I said, you know, Russia need to take a chance here because Serbia are going to have chances too. And within five minutes, it was 2-0 Serbia. Um, yeah, Russia, Russia were making chances, but the players ultimately weren't good enough. And it, it was then the players that cost them in the other end. Individual mistakes. Zhirkov slipped and, and gave the ball away for two of the goals. Guillermo should have stopped two of the goals. Um, Deveyev, who apparently played the whole first half after picking up an early concussion, um, was at fault for one of the goals. Perhaps not his fault if he was actually concussed. Um, you know, these are these are all individual errors which cost Russia on the day. Uh, and the fact that Zhukov and Zabalotny didn't come off is down to the manager. And the fact they started is down to the manager. You know, you've got... Granted that, you know, left-back position isn't necessarily the strongest Russia's... You know, it's always been a weak point. Um, you know, they, there's been numerous players who've come through, like Nabi Ulin, who who got a couple of caps but have then faded back away from the squad. Um, but there's a couple of there's a there are some good young left backs coming through, especially in Krugervoy. Um who you think, you know, they, they should be he's at you know, Krugervoy's twenty two, that is a good age to get into the national team and start playing some games, especially in this national break. Like stick him in against Moldova, no problem. Um I think that the play is not good enough, but it's Church Soft's fault for picking them. There there are better players to be picked. Uh, the, the squad, in theory, is good enough to compete. There are lots of good individual players there. Uh, and as you pointed out, with, with Wales and plenty of other examples over the years of all football, a bad team can still win games and win tournaments and win trophies if they're being coached well. You know, the, the Leicester team, for example, you know they, they weren't good enough. Rostov team finished second in the Premier League. They, they weren't really good enough, but they were being managed and coached well enough to make it happen. Um, and Russia have got good enough players to do to pull out results and to have won that group, as one of our guys in the chat earlier said. You know, he woke up and said, "How have you lost five 0 to Serbia? Scotland beat them the other day, and they were dreadful. Serbia are missing a lot of their key players during that game because of COVID, and and you know, we got trounced. So uh, I would put it more on the coach still." Yeah, yeah, I, I agree absolutely. I've seen a lot of arguments that people have been defending Churchesov, and there was a there was an article that sticks to mind most recently in Championat. I believe it went up yesterday or the day before. It was it was at the weekend at some point, um, early midweek. Sorry, after the weekend at some point, and it was by Andrei Pankov. And we'll get more into Pankov and some Russian journalists later on. Is a bit of a spoiler to one of our topics later, but in this, he say he basically it's a bit of a long read in that he is giving quite a staunch defense of churches of and we weirdly most of the the it, it basically mirrors most other articles that i've seen which is defending churches of that um injury is a massive issue um the gap between the first team and the replacements of the first team such as um moran chuck for missing out a lot of recent time and golovan still missing fernandez missing zuba missing and then center backs getting injured and so on um, yeah, that I yes, there is injury issues right now, but there's as you said, David, quite eloquently, there's more than enough adequate and talented enough cover to replace these players. They shouldn't have been playing. Like I've seen people say that he he, he should continue because he made the brave decision to change it at the half time. Well, he made the brave decision to change it after at half time after already being four 0 down. And two of the substitutions that he needed to make, he still didn't make. One of which played the entirety of the 90 minutes, despite the fact he's about 47 and nowhere near good enough. <laughs> so you, you just see these defences of this man, and none of them are actually 
oh, church yourself can go and do this. And you, you can't see a path to where he actually expands upon the way the team are playing now. It, it's all f- far too reactive. It's it's just not enough coaching going on whatsoever. It's something that I mean, we we harken back to English a lot because we look, we are all English. It's it's something that we can relate to. And there's this in Russia as well. There's this circus of managers who keep flitting from job to job, and are nowhere near good enough. Dmitry Gunka somehow got into Kimki, despite everybody knowing that he's absolutely woeful. Sergey Yuran before him, not the best, but did a far better job than Gunka. Jerevchenka recently sacked from Arsenal Tula for the Arsenal basically losing their way and being horrendous defensively, which Jerevchenka really sorted out at Kimki right now, is just proving that some of these managers don't deserve it. And Churchesov is a fine manager. Yeah, he, he's all right. But he's far too conservative, far too reactive and has his old boys club and it just doesn't work at a national level. He should never be manager of the national team. It's absolutely crazy. So, Richard, you, you, you did mention a few other options earlier to replace Churchesov. Do you, you have also kind of championed the idea of some of the bigger Russian clubs going towards a foreign manager? Now, Russia haven't had a foreign manager in since what was it, Fabio Capello, I believe, was the last one. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Would you support Russia moving to a foreign manager now, say, if Jurgensov was sacked? I think it's something probably, uh, James, that they'd have to consider um, because at the end of the day, like I was saying earlier, it, I think this season has just shown that there's there really is a paucity of, of, of Russian coaches at the moment who 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 are actually of a good level, you know, and, and I don't just think it's Russia either. I think across the whole of the former USSR, you know, apart from really, you know, how many names are really coming off the tongue? Like Slutsky, you know, Sergei Rebrov's doing a good job at uh, Ferenc Varos. You know, he got into the Champions League group stage. Yeah, Shevchenko's done quite well. You know, he could get a job in Western Europe in the future. But apart from that, across Russia and the whole of the ex-Soviet Union, there's not a lot of good managers at the moment, I have to be honest. Um, and like like you just like you just been saying just now, you know how play it, people like Dmitry Gunko just carry on, you know, getting jobs when it's evidently clear they're not good enough. Uh, Dimitro Parfionov at Arsenal Tula, you know, um, our uh, resident um, Ural supporter Andrew Flint, you know, his opinion of Parfionov is very very negative um, based on the chat that we always uh, that that we well, well, that we have on our Facebook chat, and um, I was stunned when I saw him. Resurrected at Arsenal Tula, despite them in poorly at Ural. Um, and yeah, I think a foreign coach would have to be something that Spore and I would have to consider if if they did decide to displace um, Churchesov. Because apart from really Galationov, who's done a good job with the under 21s, and maybe one or two others, maybe Cherevchenko, maybe, maybe Slutsky, but again, I don't see them really leaving their club jobs at the moment. I think. You know, it's it's a real problem, and and you know, I think we're, we've already seen this in the Champions League and Europa League with the Russian and ex USSR managers coaching clubs at the moment. The, the the teams there are not doing very well, and yet you look at, you know, Spartak and Dinamo at the moment both look, you know, like the the sides in an upward trajectory because they've got good young foreign managers coaching them. So. Yeah, I think it was, if they did decide to get rid of Stani before the, well, anytime soon, then alongside Galationov stepping in from the 21s, I think they'd probably have to bring in, they'd have to probably consider bringing in a foreign manager, yeah? Yeah. And there's a little last note on, on Churchesov right now. This this uh, particular 5-0 loss against Serbia has meant that Russia, as things stand, have dropped down into the third uh, seedings pot for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. And after the game, Churchesov was asked about his future, and to which he replied, Firstly, this is not a question for me. Secondly, we started this tournament well, but did not finish it well. Today's game that a team showed that a team should be a team. We have a lot of young people, and they all fail to sight play. Thoughts to leave the bench? Do you have a special mood? Move on to the next question. So basically, he, he kind of dodged it and then <laughs> admitted that he's not going to be resigning. It's really interesting that he actively mentioned the younger players and and not not, not blamed them in any way as a manager. No good manager does that in public. Maybe that's a problem. But he actively mentioned these younger players and saying that they failed to perform. Well, I'm sorry, but th- these younger lads are the ones that you should have been giving a much more prominent opportunity to. And the ones who really failed to perform, if I remember 
correctly, the worst players on the pitch were none of the younger players because you don't give them enough of a chance. You keep people like Zhirkov and Zabalotny who were terrible. So anyway, that's a, a last little word on Church's off features there. And next we'll move on to the RFN mailbag. And of course, every now and again, we ask yourselves, our listeners and, and followers on Twitter for some uh, questions that you have. And I would like to, as a little segue between these two, honourable mentions to Hanu and Alexi, who are um, both RFN writers. And they asked, Hanu asked, when should Stani be fired? And why was it yesterday? And Alexi asked, should Chichesov be sacked, <laughs> resign, or just get the F out? Now, we have already covered those two today, but it's fair to say, in my opinion, Ch- Chichesov should probably stick to his day job of being the bad guy in the film, The Green Zone. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen that photo, I will tweet it out after the podcast because the the main fella in the main bad fella in the the film is the absolute ringer of Churches of. But anyway, um, question one is from Yaroslav Matveyev or y- at Yaro Matveyev on Twitter. Uh, why is the foreigner limit still in place? As it clearly damages the quality of football so much. Now I'll take this one myself. In my opinion. Um, Yes, it absolutely damages the quality of football. We're seeing that at an international level, a European level and a domestic level. Uh, The stockpiling of players in certain positions means we're at a complete lack and loss of players in in other ones. Going in towards the World Cup, we had about 400 right-backs who were very good and then not a single defensive midfielder who was actually fit. Yuri Gazinski got the nod. A lot of people didn't quite think he was up to the level that was required and he he did a, a, a decent job in filling in. But we still haven't really filled that position There's because it, it, it's a longer term thing. Then you see the massive issues of clubs struggling on the European level. And when you look at Zenit, who've had Asmu and Malcolm and Zuba and Driussi missing for different parts of their group stage, without that core attacking unit, there's just nowhere near enough quality to really step in to take their place. And the main reason for that is because of the foreigner limit. Now they have that unit to play in Thursday, what Tuesday, Wednesday nights midweek, midweek in Champions League, and then they have the second team of the Russian guys of like Mostovoy would step in, Alexis Sutorman would step in, Yarokin would step in historically, and probably win at the weekend as they did last year and won the league at Takanta as they did the year before, won the league at Takanta, but they still suffered in Europe. Now this year they're suffering in Europe and suffering in the league because the first choice lot are out. So they don't have anybody good enough to step into Europe in the in the European games, and that is simply comes down to the fact that there is a, a manufactured top end limit on who these players can buy. These things will only work if every single league in Europe has the manufactured top end limit. Why is it still in place? Purely because I don't think the RFU have the foresight to see the issues that this is having on the game. Either they don't see it or they don't accept the, of the cause of it. They look at the World Cup and think, ah, quarter final in the home World Cup, brilliant. They look at the Champions League qualification and say, ah, more Russian clubs in the Champions League than ever before in the group, full of group stages. Yeah, there are more Russian clubs in the Champions League than ever before in the group stages. And what's the result of that? Less points than ever before in the group stages. But at the halfway stage, not a single one of them have won for the first time ever. Is that really the sign of success? Is Russia stumbling their way to the quarter final with a 38 year old in goal, a 35 year old, a 38 year old in centre back, a 35 year old in goal, a 37 year old at left back, a 34 year old up front, stumbling their way to the quarter final through passion, pride, genuine grit and determination and then Dennis Cherisher finally finding some form for the first time in 15 years is that really the, the answer to the long term ga- future of the game absolutely not but these people either fail to see it or choose to ignore it because they can brush this issue the real issues under the carpet and just plaster them with some sort of nationalistic issue it's, uh, anyway I'll, I'll stop now because we have other questions to answer and other guys need to jump in but <laughs> why they don't fail. The, the RFU failed to see that that is the main issue affecting the game in Russia right now. Question two from Mike P, which is at the Mikey Ice on Twitter. Tell me why Kachayev, Oblyakov, Akhmatov isn't the Russia of Russia's the future of Russia's midfield behind Moranchuk and Golovin, of course. David, what do you think? Kachayev, Oblyakov, and Akhmatov is that the future? Well, he's asked me to tell him why. And I don't think I can tell him a good reason why. Uh, 
to be quite honest, especially after the dross mid well, just absolutely terrible performance uh, of the midfield he played against Serbia, which was Ostoyev, Kuzayev, and Yurokin. All three, especially Kuzayev, I noticed, were dreadful. Kuzayev was so slow, like just yeah, he was he was really really poor. Um, you know, th those three. They, they are good midfielders on the day. You know, Yurokin's on fantastic form this season for Zinni. He, he's bundling in goals left, right and centre. Uh, and Ozdoyev, I think we've all sort of mentioned that he's, he's slightly regressed a little bit. Um, but Oblikov came on and he, he did well. Um, obviously, on your, on the best day, you're going to want in that midfield, Gorgin, Alexei Miranchuk, potentially Anton Miranchuk depending if you think you can fit those three in there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tough fit. You, mm -hmm. Ideally, you'd probably want those as... You, you want the, the, the Moranchuk's higher up. Golovin sitting in midfield with God knows who, Oblyakov, Akhmetov. Uh, and then maybe you can slip um, slip Kachayev in as one of the attacking trio uh, with the Moranchuk's. You know, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of talent. And those three guys, Oblyakov, Akhmetov and Kachayev, for my money... Uh, maybe Akhmetov this season because he's recovering from his injury, but Oblikov and Kachayev uh, deserved to play uh, this international break far more than Yurokin, Kuzyayev and, and Ozdoyev. So, you know, I, th I think he's dead on. Those three are big potential players who, who will get a lot of caps for Russia. I have no doubts about it. Yeah, absolutely. Oblikov's versatility is a huge bonus. You've seen him play defensive midfield box-to-box -box role and an attacking role on the wing left wing back mid left wing for after the attacking midfield for Siska and I've been really impressed by Oblyakov since he's became a regular at Siska since he's moved to Ufa uh, from Ufa for, sorry and he's been probably in my eyes one of the best Russians in the league this season so far uh, the next question which is from Hanu at Hanu <laughs> What are your predictions for next week's European games? Richard, what do you think? Oh, goodness, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to cheer us up anymore, is it? <laughs> um, well, it's actually quite interesting about, actually quite interesting about um, Lokomotiv. Obviously, they go away to Atletico Madrid. Apparently, I was reading today on, I listened to some Spanish football podcasts, and I was reading today about apparently how Luis Suarez and um, Lucas Torreira uh, both currently in quarantine with COVID. Apparently, um, the Uruguay national team, um, they caught it while on international uh, duty. So those two obviously aren't going to be playing against uh, Atletico, which is a blow to them. Blow to, well, blow to Atletico, but a boost for Locomotive because, um, you know, two players instantly unavailable for um, Atletico. But I mean, they're still going away, Loco, to the, um, the uh, Estadio Metropolitano in Madrid. It's going to be tough for them there. Um, I think they'll, again, show some resilience, show some fight. But I see Lokomotiv going down 2-1 against um, Atletico. Atletico winning 2-1 that game. Krasnodar against Sevilla. I think this could be interesting. I don't know if Krasnodar are getting a bit, a few more of their players back now from injury and from COVID. So you just never know with this game. I mean, if Krasnodar can show the kind of form that they did in the first half against Sevilla, and Sevilla have had a stuttering start to the league, they've not been as good as what I was expecting them to be. Um, and, you know, at the weekend, Tamboff have got a, you know, sorry, Krasnodar have got a game against Tamboff at home, so that that's pretty straightforward on paper. I think they should win that. It's not like they've got a tough game at the weekend, so it's just throw all the effort at this um, this Champions League game midweek. No, I think they could even probably rest a few players against Tamboff at home. I think they should still be able to overcome them. Go on, I'm going to be optimistic with uh, Krasta. I'll say 1-1 at home against Sevilla. Um, Zenit away at Lazio. I can't see Zenit getting a win here. With my optimistic head on, I'd probably say they might be able to eke out a point, but sadly, I think I'm going to go for another Zenit defeat. I'm going to say 2-1 to Lazio. And Siska versus Feyenoord. Um, go on, this is where I'll, I'll try and be optimistic. But again, I'm saying this with a great deal of um, trepidation and fear. I'll say 2-1 to Siska at home against Feyenoord. Because it's worth remembering in that game against Feyenoord, even though you know it wasn't great, two of Feyenoord's goals were offside. You know, when obviously there's no VAR in the Europa League, so it wasn't picked up. I mean, I still think Siska played pretty poorly on the night, but... Hopefully they can, you know, show their league form in Europe eventually. And I, I can't see them continuing to play this poorly in Europe. So I think that that group is still passable on paper, even though they've made it hard for themselves. So 
I'll try and be optimistic with Cisco. I'll say 2-1 at home against Feyenoord that they'll win. And my God, we need a win. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we could just get one this week. We'd... Russia's really falling down low, quite potentially going to fall down quite low on the coefficients if these teams don't start getting their act together. And some injuries back from Krasodar particularly, and a few from Zenit as well. So hopefully a bit more optimistic. Uh, next question's from... The Great Dane and, of course, former editor of the site himself, Toka Thielade. Uh, do we ever get the Cheryshev breakthrough we've always wanted? Now, he's only had two se- senior seasons with 15-plus league starts and 1,000 league minutes in his career, and he's turning 30 in December. So, David, do you think Cheryshev will ever break through? Um, well, I'm not sure how he's considering how what state Valencia are in at the moment. Um, I'm not sure how much he's actually playing for them. Uh, you know, he, he does offer something Russia a, a bit different just because Russia don't particularly have any out-and-out wingers. It would have been great if Lesavoy had not had a dubious COVID test this break. I'd love to have seen him get his debut against Moldova and, and give Russia something different because he's the he's the only other guy. Mostavoy, him, him and Mostavoy, obviously Mostavoy did come on um, but most of all, he isn't quite as direct as uh, as Lester Boy is. Um, so he, he's always going to be a valuable asset to the Russian squad, and they always hold a special place in the squad because of what he did at the World Cup. You know, he, he turning up and suddenly you know, doing everything pretty much, um, and being a Russian player who has talent, and you know, is is semi regularly playing in a league bigger than the RPL, he's always going to get called up if he's fit enough. Um, pretty much uh, until until he's, his legs start to go, which probably isn't far off to be honest. So um, I think we just have to deal with the fact that he you know he is talented. He he will be around for the next few years, I'm sure, in and out of the squad when he when he's available. Um, but hopefully we can get some some of the domestic based wingers to to kick on and and try and try and oust him. Uh, from the squad eventually, or, or not else him, replace him. Yeah, you mentioned that it's probably not going to be too far long before his legs do go, and of course wingers tend to experience that a little bit earlier than lots of other positions. But I genuinely don't know if Cheryshev's legs have ever been there in the first place. I think he's basically made out of cotton wool. And yeah, he's. we will get this reported breakthrough, will always be for forever, just a couple of years away. Um, I, I entirely agree. I would like to see younger, more direct players brought into the team because that is something that Russia have a dearth of, of genuine, explosive directness out wide. Most of the players in that position who will get forced out wide, like Maranchuk and, and Golovan, neither are wingers, but they'll get shoehorned out there and neither have that explosive directness that you really need from a team who quite majority plays on the counter. Um, the next question is from... Locomotive Moscow's number one satirical writer, 2006, and that's Ilya Sokolov. Is <laughs> Sergey Uran a fraud or a genius? <laughs> um, as always, Ilya, the question is generally down the middle of exactly of that. Um, Uran was was fine at Kimki last year, of course, led them to the Russian Cup final, um, in which they were quite valiantly lost to Zenit 1-0. Um, also led them to RPL promotion, of course, but I think most of Uran's solid work last season was really on the coattails and building upon the foundations that was put place by put in place by Andrei Talalayev, who then almost kept Krilia up when it seemed so unlikely. And they did go down in the end, but generally played some really good stuff and were actually only relegated due to a, a COVID technical result. Um, has now moved on to Akhmat and similarly doing quite good work with Akhmat. Solid base to work upon and then gets his gets his team working from there. Um Yuran continued that work and he deserves credit for coming in and not upsetting the apple cart. Did the job, got them promotion, got them the cup final, which really cannot be cannot be sniffed at. Um and he's now currently at Skar Karlovsk and Skar had not won at all since August before his arrival in October. Um since his arrival they've un- they're unbeaten in seven, winning six of them. Weirdly enough, Drew with Ertish Omsk, who were awful. Um, 
have scored an absolute hatful in that time and are currently the last Fina L team to remain in, in the cup again. So, so Uran really does have a bit of a love affair with the Russian Cup of late. Um, is he a fraud? No. Is he a genius? Um, no. <laughs> Question number six from Frederick Brockert at Brockert F on Twitter. Is Sponaya underperforming or is this just the level we can expect from this generation, David? Now, we did touch upon that a little bit earlier, but what do you think? Uh, yeah, we yeah we did touch a little bit. I think I think they have underperformed. You know, the the the, the game against Moldova was experimental, uh, especially by Church sort of standards. Um, so, so I'll let that one slide. The fact that it was a pretty abject game, um, but with with not many chances created. The Turkey game I didn't see, but I know Russia had some very bad refereeing decisions go against them. Uh, I haven't seen the Semyonov red card, but I heard it was harsh. Uh, and then the penalty which was given, which eventually was the winning goal for Turkey, was absolutely not a penalty. Um, so, and, and you know, we talked about the Serbia game. You know, there was some bad luck. The first goal Serbia scored was a long-range effort that deflected and flew into the top corner. Uh, and then it sort of all unraveled from, from there. Um, but, yeah, they're underperforming. The, the, the squad... Is not being utilised to its its best, uh, or even filled with its best. Uh, so Russia can definitely do better. We we know that. We we know this squad can do better. We've seen them, you know, even in the first half this year, the second half of last year, we saw them picking up great international results. Um, so yeah, they are, they are performing, and um, and they should definitely be doing better. Um, we just have to sw swallow it and. Uh, and hope for hope for better in the future. Next questions from Stephen Fenton at Stephen Fenton eighty eight. So Richard, could Churchesov play himself in goal, or as age is now irrelevant? <laughs> God, if he carries on picking Zhirkov, then uh, why the hell not at his current rate? I mean, goodness, you know, it's just it's unbelievable, isn't it? Um... <laughs> Well, I mean, is he a million miles, even at 50, 56, 57 now, is he a million miles worse than what Guillermo is? Um, I mean, I've just never honestly been impressed with Guillermo at all since, you know, I follow, started following the league, you know, frequently uh, back in around 2015, 16 time, you know, when I first started taking a, you know, interest in, in weekly proceedings in the RPL, not just um, glances here and there. I, I've honestly just never been that impressed with him, Guillermo. I don't know what it is. You know, there the, the must be about four or five, six keepers in the league, all, all better him. Um, and yet, somehow, for some reason, whenever, like, you know, someone like, um, you know, whenever a Akin favor retires from international duty or, you know, um, Anton Shunin is unavailable due to, obviously, what we've mentioned before with the inconclusive COVID test, Stanley just keeps going back to him. You know, Guillermo, he keeps going back to him. And I don't understand why, you know, there's other keepers you can try, you know, Um I'd rather they just, you know, even, you know, carry, uh, carry on with Shunin, you know, as first choice. Or, you know, if Shunin is unavailable or loses form, then try one of the younger guys. Try Maximenko. Try Safonov. Even, you know, I'd, I'm even prone to him. I'm even, you know, supporter of the idea of giving Yuri Dupin a call, call up. You know, he's been a very consistent goalkeeper for the last two, three seasons in the RPL. And, you know, just never seems to get a look in. It's always Guillermo. I don't understand it. You know, I really, I'm just, I'm just baffled. So to answer the question directly, well, Stanley in goal wouldn't be a million miles worse than Guillermo. I've got to admit, even despite his, um, despite his, um, him being in his mid fifties now. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that aside from Akinfeev, who's obviously retired, but a class above still, um, and aside from the two young lads, because it's unfair to judge them too much so early in their careers. Yeah. I think Dupin, Shunin, and Alexander Belenov are probably my three picks of Russians in goal. Um, and it's down to their consistency. And Guilherme is just nowhere near consistent enough for my liking. He, the game against Atleti showed that way. He pulled off three or four brilliant saves in the second half. Like, he had a personal battle with João Felix and and that one when um oh what when Felix had the header and Guilherme kind of reached up to the far top stanchion and like 
put clawed the ball over the top. It was a brilliant yeah, save. I remember that. But then, like, look at him at the weekend when he couldn't even. Um, I, I was going to say he couldn't catch a certain flu, but it might be a little bit disrespectful, so I'll not. Um, <laughs> he couldn't even like catch a thing. He was terrible. And against Atleti, the goal was his fault. It was such an easy save to make. It was at a comfortable height, just palm it around, and he just completely takes his eye off it and misses it. it it's a bit of a shame that Leonid Slutsky fell out of a tree trying to save a cat all those years ago, because I think he'd do a really good job. <laughs> but um, the next question is from Nikolai Poulsen at NickPo3. <laughs> will Artem Zuba leak more masturbation videos, or will he just create an OnlyFans page instead? <laughs> <laughs> when should he be allowed be back in the team if he doesn't? So, Richard, when should Zuba be allowed back in the team? Yeah, a pass on the first part of that question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Uh, one thing I will say, I listened to the pod last week and um, I listened to your, you, James, um, and um, Hanu and um, Artem's opinion about the Zuba affair. And I completely agree with everything that you said. I think that whilst ultimately, yes, it is embarrassing that that video got leaked, at the end of the day, the backlash from it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, calls for him to be stripped to the Russia captaincy, dropped from the national team, sold by... I mean, there's even ludicrous reports going round about now MLS clubs, Turkish clubs and, and clubs in the Middle East buying Zuba. You know, I mean, goodness, it, it's really, you know, it's... Whilst, obviously, it's silly and, you know, ultimately, it's embarrassing. You know, there's been far, far, far worse that's happened in, in football. You know, I mean, compare that to the Golovin and... Um, Sorry, not yeah, the uh, not not the Golvin, the um Kokorin and um the Kokorin um Mamayev. Mamayev, yeah, sorry, his name just left me for a moment. Yeah, compare that to the Kokorin and Mamayev incident and uh, you know, that's obviously far worse than what Artem Zuba's done. You know, so yeah, storming the teacup completely and um and as for returning to the team, well I actually think that despite our criticism of Stanley recently, uh, for the national team, um I think he was right to drop Zuba for the national team for this international break for a couple of reasons. First reason is obviously to clear his mind of all this, what has happened and gone on. Um, I think that was the correct thing, take him out of the limelight for a little bit. But I also think with Zuba, I actually think this break might do him some good because his performances lately, whilst not being terrible, they've been below their usual self. And I think it's purely because I think he's needed a break, you know, because if you look at it with Zenit, with him and Asmoon in the side, in the, in the squad, there's barely any other natural strikers in their squad. So him and Asmoon pretty much just play all the time. And I'm beginning to wonder whether this, you know, this this schedule, I think all clubs are struggling with it everywhere around the world. You know, not just in Russia, but everywhere around the world. All clubs are struggling with this relentless calendar. So I feel that, you know, maybe Zuba sitting out this recent international break, in a way it might do him some good because it might re- uh, refresh him. Um allow him time to reflect, but also time to refresh too. So um, I think given Russia's lack of depth in the striker position too, you know, I don't think this incident that occurred just on the eve of the last international break, I don't think that's going to affect his presence in the in the national team going forward for in a cycle between, you know, now and the Euros next summer and in the build-up to the Qatari World Cup, which I think will probably be a swan song on the international scene. So, you know, given the lack of striking options Russia has at the moment, I think she will be back in the side. But I do think it was a rare good decision by Stani during this international break or in and around the international break period by taking Zuba out the side. But for a couple of reasons, like I've said, take him out the side to uh, take away all the spotlight from him after the incident and also possibly to give him a break. But I think he'll be back in the side pretty sharp, yeah. I, would, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's hard to forget that. It's easy to forget of recent late, recent times with his form that he is Russia's leading goal scorer nearly um, in considerably less games than who is first in, in Kozhikov. Uh, question nine from Hanu again. Why is Russian football so traumatic? Um, now you can see Hanu, this is why most of us who've been covering Russian football for a long time are going bald. Um, we're not just getting <laughs> old now. We're actively pulling our hair out constantly for forever. Um, but no, yeah, it's that's one of the, the things that we all love about the nation and love about football in the nation that it's very unique and you never get a bored week good or bad uh, question 10 and that's again from Ilya uh, what do you think of some of the Russian sports media any favourites or any you dislike in particular um, so I did go on a little bit of a rant last week um, about a certain journalist and look it's Slava Malamud I'll say it um, 
he's a Russian who lives in America, writes for American news sites, and it seems to be one of those who's got a little bit of an agenda, who comes in and and his job is to kind of disparage Russia, which look you you always need to be in the middle ground with these with these sort of east versus west things that tend to go on because you just need a clear head to be able to sit back and evaluate it efficiently um he he's always a little bit too too prone to want to attack um but talking rush guys who are russian experts whenever you listen to like an english podcast or or whatever anything that's non russian the russian expert tends to be one of four people and that's either gosha chernov Sasha Gorionov, Mikhail Yokin, or Arta Petrosian. Um, the problem with these guys, or Jonathan Wilson, of course, who's English, so we'll leave him out. But the problem with the other guys is that they don't really focus much on Russia anymore. Only one of them lives in Russia still, and you can tell that they just don't really watch the RPL and Finnail week in, week out anymore by their sort of too generic ambivalent and at times vague answers jonathan wilson particularly you can see that his book's great it's a brilliant introductory book the behind the curtain i recommend anyone to read it for an introduction to eastern european and russian football but once you then get away from that quick introduction you realize that below the surface is not really amount there a lot amount there it's kind of like the opposite of an iceberg um because he he's a world-renowned journalist who focuses on lots of different things he cannot just focus on russia all the time it's completely understandable for domestically um big fan of um stanislav egorov's work one of the old guard really uh, very level-headed very eloquent very erudite in his thinking and and really puts that across well um the other yegorov dima yegorov is i think the symbol of what's wrong in a lot of the Russian media right now, where it's far too sensationalist. It's far too focused upon the image and life and enjoyment of the job rather than the substance of actually writing well and and covering efficiently. Turning up in a press box in a Spartak shirt is a big no-no in 90% of the countries in the world. Yet every time you're in a press box in Russia, you see somebody cheering in the press box, wearing a shirt, wearing scarves, taking selfies. They're not even there with a laptop covering the game or anything. They're not even writing reports. They're just there doing it all on social media. It's it's kind of a bigger problem than just journalism, bigger problem than just Russia. Um, ones that I do like, uh, Andrei Pankov, Championat, very reliable. Um, yeah, David, I don't know if you want to jump in on your opinions on some Russian journalism in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm with you. I, I used to enjoy, quite enjoy following uh, Dima Yegorov on, on social media uh, because he was active. You know, it, it gave me a good insight into you know what it was like to go to Russian football games and stuff like that. But eventually, I had to, I had to just stop following. Just uh, you know, he, he's very clearly a, a big homophobe and, and a bit of a, a bit of a racist. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you, you know, going going to games, um, you know, wearing your wearing your colours isn't isn't ideal. Uh, and I think even he's moving away from it now. He, I think he plays football for um, uh, Amcal, which is like a uh, hash, it's like a hashtag United of, of Russia. It's just full of full of social media guys, and he, he's playing for them now. I think rather than more of being more of a journalist. Um, yeah, I, I like Andrew Pankov as well. Um, people who I don't like, I, I don't like um, Vasily Utkin. I don't particularly like uh, Mikhail Boroskin. Uh, Boroskin, Boroskin. I forget, mm. I forget his name. I like um, Gile Yegorov. Um, I like Ivan Zhidkov. He's from uh, Sports Day by Day, I believe. Uh, I have to give a shout out to the guys from uh, Sports Business Online in Kazan. Uh, you know, Vlad Simagulov and Irach Chamilov. Uh, uh, and I think they have a guy, or used to have a guy called Ivan Karpov, who, who is particularly reliable. Um, but yeah, I met met both the guys, both those guys, when I was in Kazan. Uh, but we, you know, we 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 also have contacts with a lot of journalists from from regional regional cities, as well as just the big ones. You know, I I try and avoid following the guys who like, well, you know, looking at the guys too much who, who you mentioned earlier. The, the guys who are the go-tos for English press. So I'm, all, I'm more following the, the guys who are going to report on Russian football. Um, 
you know, guys like we've got guys like we mentioned before. Um, so I won't say too much about like uh, Gorionov and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, we, like there's a journalist from from Tula who, who we get on with well. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's there's some that are that are jumping to mind who who are who are quite like and you know there are some good Russian football journalists absolutely out there, um, mm. but there are also some some ones who I, I would I would say to avoid if, if you were looking to get into it. Yeah, and one of the big ones that a lot of people who tend to be introduced to Russian journalism and Russian sports journalism is you probably come across first is generally Igor Rabiner. Um, Rabiner's a brilliant author, very, very talented writer. And some of his books, like the one on Spartak, The Outsider and so on, are all very, very good reads. Difficult to find in English, I will admit. Um, the Slutsky biography is one of the highest selling books in Russia of all time. But he embodies another problem of Russian sports journalism right now, where it's it's far too tabloid heavy. Um, it's all it's, it's it's like English, like journalism in general, is either a lot of it is local press area press um, local press who struggle to make ends meet. It's all about generating clicks, and that's it. It's there's very little long form, very little analytics, very little real analysis never mind yeah. analytics and that's not anything against press that's just because of the way that journalism is these days when you then go to a national level it's all sensationalist tabloid crap in most countries and russia is one that really suffers from that especially when you look at some of the dailies are just rife with awful sensationalist headlines where it'll be like the zuba one for example the weekend was Zuba scandal dropped from national team and then you look at the body of the article and it's literally just as many words as what's in the headline and the deck put together like you click on these articles and it's like two paragraphs at most there's just not enough long form genuine analysis out there and that's why I keep pushing and we work with the guys at Register um, register Register.one their whole job and their whole passion is long form football analysis for free and I'd really recommend people to go there. That's register.one and counterpress.ru as well. Really smaller sites who are really doing the work that the bigger sites are letting go. And like I say, Rabina's kind of a, 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 a symptom of that or a symbol of that where he used to be really, really highly thought of, still is highly thought of as a very talented writer, but it's just mm. a little bit of a dinosaur on the football end and is imprisoned within a system of system which doesn't reward people in high paid jobs anymore unfortunately think, it's a bigger issue sorry i think um it, it seems to me from from an outside perspective obviously we're not professional journalists we're we're hobbyists and, you know we, we follow this for our own uh, amusement or not amusement but because we are interested in it but it seems to me from the outside that if a british journalist is looking to write something about russia say where a british team's playing a russian team or there's a particular event in Russia they want to cover I'm sure some British journalists at one point will contact Victor Moses for something they'll be directed to by their channels towards them like Rana or to Petrosian because they're you know they they are the highest profile and they have they can speak English that like that's always going to be there the first ones they're going to be directed to uh, and you know there are different levels of journalists there you know there's journalists like uh, like Karpov or Pang of or Matinian or Zemin or Ignatov, a lot of the guys at Sports 24, who they're good journalists and they'll cover the day to day. You know, they'll pick up on things like they'll get stories on transfers, they get stories mm. on injuries. Um, but at the top level, at the level above that, you've got the guys who are journalists slash pundits, which I think is probably more what what Petrosian and, and Rabiner are leaning towards now. Even yeah. Goryanov, Yaroshevsky, who we talked about, they're, they're pundits. These are guys who are actually appearing on TV uh, in Russia and England. Uh, and it's a different level, as we know in the UK, you know, British pundits are very sensationalist and often not very good at being pundits. A lot of the pundits <laughs> in the British media get, get slated. I'm thinking of Garth Crooks in particular. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so it's a different it's a different level. But I mean, obviously, I'm not putting Igor Rabiner in the same group as, as Garth Crooks. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, there's, there's different levels of, of journalism and there, and there are definitely, yeah, there's definitely different groups. Um, and yeah. I think... The, those guys are picking up the jobs just because they're the reliable contacts at, at, in this generation. Mm-hmm. 
the overwhelming problem isn't against these people per se. There is some, like you mentioned, Yegorov's own personal views, from my own personal views, are abhorrent. I will stand against that. But most of these guys are basically trapped in a system which is increasingly irrelevant in a more digital and futuristic and basically did social age. Um, because of social media and the onset of all of that, newspapers are dying out. Journalism itself is dying out. The average read on a long-form article is three seconds. So what does it matter if Champion are publishing a 1,000-word article on why Kim Ki are very good this season? Or a one paragraph on why Zuba had a wank on, tel- on on his phone, because that's what the people at the top want, and that's what they tell those and the next level down to do. And at the end of the day, it's a vocation first rather than a passion, and that's where we're lucky because we can remove ourselves from the situation without any editorial pressure. Obviously, without any money, our offenders is runs at a loss, but because of that, we can focus on the football and focus on the things that interest us rather than having editorial oversight and having too much pressure on top of our shoulders to right now you must write about the transfer window 17 times a day for the next 17 days because it gets the most clicks and um, most of these guys would like i said i don't want to stress that we're having a go at these people because most of these guys do really put a lot of work in and are symptoms of a wider issue of journalism, not just in Russia, but across the world. Um, but it's it's interesting from our point of view that the press is so similar, but also so different. Um, you get the same uh, mistrust of the West and the East and the East and the West. You get the same editorial oversight from the top. You get the same connections to governments at, at the top. You get the same tabloid sensationalism. You get the same long form who are often the shadows doing their own little thing. But the weird thing is, is that English press is very stiff up a lip institutional. It's very based on tradition, based on uh, a lot of it is based on etiquette and how you mm-hmm. act and how you are. When you're in a press box and when you're in a mix zone, when you're in a media center, there is a way to go about things and a way to hold yourself. Russian is very different. It's th- Maybe this is why it's so jarring seeing people in mix zones taking selfies with players and having a hug and seeing people in press boxes going wild and not writing on a laptop and sweating because they've got a deadline it is jarring for us because it's so different it's such a different culture but i can see where the pitfalls and the good sides are of both of it there's a less intense atmosphere and it opens people up in russia certainly does open the players up you can see that some of the players and some of the journalists have genuine relationships it's a lot more intense and a lot more scrutiny and a lot more difficult for people to open up as is in England. But at the same time, on the other hand, there is, without insulting, it seems like sometimes in some press boxes in Russia, there's just a distinct lack of professionalism. And that's when I have issues with, as I mentioned, the, the social media people. Um, but that's a 21st century. And we'll have to finish because the we, we have overrun here and we spent longer in question 10 than i think we did the most of the others in the mailbag put together but it is an interesting one from our point of view anyway and hope hope you all enjoyed it as well but finally guys the the rpl's back it's been a pretty hellish and boring two weeks in my opinion but at least <laughs> half the world have got some new video game consoles and football manager demos and beaters have kept us all occupied during the break the big game of the weekend is of course bartak versus dinamo in moscow where the hosts are out of sorts and the away side are on fire after a 5-1 victory over Loco last week. And it's quite an interesting matchup with the two coaches of German footballing heritage face off against each other for the first time in Russia. Elsewhere, resurgent Rotter hosts Ural and Ufa face Kimki down at the basement battle, while Ruben and Rostov battle out for mid-table mediocrity in Kazan. David, anything to promote this week? Um... I suppose the only thing to promote, uh, I've got another profile in the, in the latest Scouted Football Handbook. Um, this time it's another Spartak guy, it's, uh, it's Ayrton, who I'm sure we all are big, big fans of here. So um, if you want to go and uh, read about the best 25 under 23 players of this quarter, then uh, go, go grab that. And Richard? Yeah, um, there'll be some more work of mine coming out for Heart to Football soon. Um, I won't reveal exactly what it is. But um, it's to do with a recent uh, release of a 
popular game. I'll leave it at that. But um, check out um, my upcoming pieces on Heart of Football. There'll be a few more things coming out too for Russian Football News soon as well. I've got, I've got some more pieces in the pipeline, let's just say. Um, and I'd like to echo your thoughts here, James, on the Spartak versus Dinamo game. I've got to admit, that I'm looking forward to this game. I really am. Um, Tedesco has obviously improved Spartak and Sandro Schwartz has improved Dinamo a lot. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this um, all this uh, Moscow derby. Should be should be a good, interesting game and um, difficult to call, really, because um, Spartak have had a little bit of a wobble recently, but Dinamo are playing well. So, you get the feeling whoever wins this game could be in a title race, you know, um, really could be in a title race. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, and my Twitter feed is at richdpike89, at richdpike89. Yeah, we've also introduced a pair of new writers to the site this week. As we're expanding our coverage, we've got Sean Nicolaides, of, uh, who writes the KHL. We'll be covering news articles on the regular for us. And Tom Weber, who's also going to bring some new coverage to the Russian Women's Superliga, which is something we really want to focus on and bring a little bit more to the forefront. Uh, so I want to welcome Sean and Tom to RFN Towers. And keep an eye out. Next week, we'll have a podcast uh, previewing the Siska Feyenoord game. And we'll have more of all the European previews and uh, match day reviews in the usual on the site. That's been the RFN podcast. Goodbye for now. Идет футбольный матч, летит над полем мяч. Веди его, беги, точнее его удар. Но мяч берет в ноги решительный фратар. Не напрасно футбольное поле самых ловких и смелых плечов. Здесь нужны тренировка и воля, быстрота, увлечение, расчет.